Hello and welcome to tonight's Truth Proof live stream. And I've got to thank everybody for coming on tonight's stream. We we know you've got other things to do, like watching mainstream uh, news and and TV programs. But uh, when you come to the Truth Proof live stream, it's an honour and a privilege to have you on board. So I think with only me and Paul on tonight, I think we aren't going to waste too much time. I'm just going to come in with the intro screen. Welcome everybody from the UK and around the world. And here's the intro. Well, there we are. As I said, welcome everybody to tonight's to tonight's live stream. Uh, it's a question, uh, plenty of questions in the chat for Alison who was doing the moderating. But without further ado, let's bring Paul. Hi, Les. Hi. You all right, mate? Yeah, all good. Yeah. Hello, everybody. And uh, here we are again, just me and Les tonight. I'm going to just uh, rattle on, tell you about a few new accounts. Great to see so many people in chat again. Lots of people that we know and some we don't know. And yeah, I love the names. Basil Faulty, Steve, Lisa Rod, Adam Sandor, Ralph Winter, Stephen Giles, Nick's Exploration. Hi, Nick. And I think I saw Chris writing as well earlier. We've got Sky doing moderating and uh, Alison. Thank you very much. And there'll be names I've missed, but I can only see that at the moment, guys. So how's your week been, Les? Well, I have been busy doing lots of things. Uh, video work, because uh, basically that's mostly what I do at this end. And obviously, we're just finessing things for the uh, Wolflands, the film, and uh, yeah, so we're just uh, waiting to get it all back from the audio engineers. Yeah, well, that, we did plan on going out and doing a bit of drone work earlier this week, but uh, weather put a stop on that. But yeah, I've had inundated with reports, I wouldn't say hundreds, but I've had quite a lot of reports last few weeks, and some of them I will have spoke about on a, a few other podcasts, but uh you know, I, th I think the the great to just cover a few of these today, Les. I know that I've spoke to you about a few of them, and uh, also tonight, with it just being me and Les, we'd welcome, you know, questions from you guys. So anything that comes to mind, it doesn't have to be on subject matter that we're talking about. If if you think it's relevant and it's something that we could cover, then fire it at us in capital letters, and we'll we'll go for it. Yeah. And four hundred one files as in Les. I've crazy. I spoke to him today. Co yeah, coincidence. Bumped into him in car park in Dane's Dyke. So yeah, I think I remember you telling me that earlier on. Yeah, which is uh, that's great. Yeah, so as, as I say, as you said, and I'm saying, welcome everybody to tonight's uh, stream. Uh, I've just got to throw a little bit of a, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a, a wild one out there. Is uh, everybody's probably picked up on uh, all these UFO reports around the world, and uh, obviously the Americans shooting well air. I think two balloons down and some other unidentified objects, which all seems a little bit uh, cluck and dagger stuff. Uh, I'd just like to know in the chat what everybody else thinks of what's kind of happening around the world. Is it, uh, is it a, pr uh, a prelude to uh, disclosure and things like that? I don't know. Very good question. And uh, I, I don't know myself, you know, but uh, it strikes me that th we've got all these UAPs, whatever you want to call them, UFOs, that are being seen now and the governments and the powers of the world are wanting to speak about them and to, and and show what footage they've got and be a little bit open about it yet for the last 50 years we've heard nothing and when there's been some sensational cases it's just been covered up and it, we've had to wait for 30 years for for it to clear and it's just got put into archive yet suddenly all this news has been shown to us all this there's got to be a reason and uh, we're being primed for something, and I don't think that we're going to have some kind of alien visitation, people. But we've been—I think it's a smokescreen for something else. We're being primed for something, and maybe they're just wanting us to follow the rules of the are these true, unidentified from somewhere else, you know? Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because uh, uh, I kind of uh, go into the cesspit of Twitter now and then, and uh, it's funny—it's <laughs> sort of like the roles are reversed. People, people in the UFO 
uh, genre are saying, no, this is not going to be uh, a, a release of information to tell us that aliens are here. It, it, it's kind of the opposite. They, they're using it as, as to divert our attention from other things that are happening in, uh, in the world and politics. Th now. That's what I think. And I don't know what people listening to this right now think, but that's where I am with it. Of course, I could be entirely wrong, but we've got to consider everything. Really, haven't yeah, well, we? Unless, yeah, well, un unless, Les, we already know everything. Which I don't uh, think we I've do. Got, do, you know, do you know what I mean? I think what we know is probably just held on a on a on the end of a matchstick. Mm. So that might, I might start saying that regularly. We've got to consider everything unless we already know everything. Because there's loads of people in not in chat, but all over the place who will tell you exactly what's happening. And they don't It's know. a good tagline. It's a good tagline, is that okay. Paul? Right then. So we'll just leave that with you guys in the uh, chat and see if you can come up with your own versions of what's happening. Lee Roscoe says and, it's a tester. Uh, ah, could good be, one, Lee. Lee. You know, I mean, it could be just let's just put put these things out. But there again, Lee, if it's a tester, then America's being tested. China, opposing powers are being tested. So who's doing the testing? Do, do you know what I mean? Unless it's a bluff from the other superpower, and they're saying we're having them in our airspace as well. And I don't know. Uh, somebody will know a little bit more than us. And is Don lodging? I see Don's in. I think I've seen his name mentioned. Anyway, hello, Don. So hi, Don. Yeah. Hope you're feeling yeah, better. Well, it's not been well, very welcome, well. Don. And uh, uh, okay, so I'm just going to kick off then tonight with. Um, let's see what I've got. Here. Ah, I remember you telling me earlier today you've had some some new reports in, and, and mainly that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Yeah. Some of these newer ones, as well as some uh, historic ones as well, but. Uh, You've got something in fr uh, about the voices from out of nowhere. Yeah. yeah. What's going on there, Paul? Well, I mean, that's that... what I'll call it. If when I, if and when we write about it, we do, we do a future book. I want to collect some of these stories and put them together. I'm sure there's got to be more than this out there. So, to start with, voices from the out of nowhere. Well, I'll touch on a briefly touch on a story of my own, which I've told before. It's short. It's about myself and Mary. I think it was 1980 sat in front of gas fire at my mum's house, Cunningsborough. They'd gone out for a drink, my mum and dad. And uh, I don't know what time it would be, between half eight and nine, say. 40 Towers were on. So on, there you go. Not that it matters in 1980, nobody's going to remember. And when they'd gone out, I said to Mary, shall we go upstairs? People will have heard me say this before. We just sat like that in front of gas fire. TV on, quite low. And a voice between us both just said, why? I never said it. Mary never said it. We both heard it. It weren't the TV. There were nobody else in the house. So I found that fascinating. It's all stuck with us. We talk about it. I wouldn't say every week, every month, every year, but we do talk about it odd times because it was, it was, it was unsettling and unnerving. And what made me think about it was I was contacted by a lady called Lisa. Uh, and she'd got a story to tell me, what, basically from about 1992, 93. She believes that's the year. She can't, you know, put an actual pin in it and say it was 92. And she explained that she'd been, she'd gone through a breakup with her partner, but and she'd got a little boy, and she'd just recently moved into a flat, a new flat. And times were hard. And... She she struggling, didn't know how she was going to cope. Money money were really tight. She said the next to no furniture in flat, and it was winter, very cold. Little boys struggling, sort of as in to keep warm, and and you know I don't know. We, we all know what it's like. I should think vast majority of people in chat, unless you've been born with a silver spoon, uh, of it on hard times, and that's basically what it was. So she's in the flat. She said I'd made him a bottle of cocoa. Well, that's throwing us back in time a bit, isn't it? I know it's still sold, but she said, and I took him into my bed and I was trying to settle him. She thinks, it's very cold, she thinks it was about one or two in the morning and she's feeding him. And then from out of nowhere, and there's only her in this flat, a voice, she said, in the most beautifully spoken English by a female, softly spoken, said, don't be afraid, we do exist, we are here. It's another voice from the outer nowhere. I'm, 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 I'm hoping that people listening to this tonight or afterwards might have had something like this themselves and want to get in touch. It's fascinating. Uh, this voice that was just plucked from nowhere. And uh, she said it frightened her to death. She, she feels now that it was sent actually as a, a, a message of kind of hope. Do you know what I mean? Don't despair. 
but at the time it frightened her to death. She said, no TV on, no radio, nothing. At the time she was living in, uh, I think it was called Blackley, Manchester. And uh, I'd, I'd be interested in other people's opinions on this. I mean, I'm wondering, let's assume Lisa's telling the truth. Let's assume Paul's telling the truth and Mary about this why, the mighty why. I even wrote a chapter in one of the books about it. I call it the mighty why because it was so powerful, them three letters and that one word. And this lady's heard this. So are we being monitored Did... every second of our lives? Is, is there something here now? Is, is, it too, is it too far fetched to imagine? Because I mean, she was, this, whatever this was answered her in her moment of despair. Uh, something kind of sarcastically answered me and Mary, I think. Do you know what I mean? I did, put us in his place. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious. I'd love to know other people's opinions. So, yeah, the, yeah. That's, that's the one, the mighty why. <laughs> well, a couple of things I'd like to throw in there, Paul. Well, um, this lady, has she had any other experience of uh, this type of phenomena or any, any, any type of phenomena? Which prior is... to that, no. She has done afterwards. Yeah. And we, we're kind of working through them things. I've had, uh, I've, I've had some fabulous emails off, off Lisa. Long conversation on phone. I'm going to have some more conversations with her. And yeah, yeah, the, the, there are more, more experiences to be told, should we say. But prior to that, excuse me, no. Because uh, as lots of our guests have uh, retold, and you yourself, Paul, um, it kind of, um, these things kind of follow you through your life, don't mm -hmm. they? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, when you, even if you say, say you came across something like this quite accidental, and I don't know whether any of it's accidental, but let's assume that you saw a UFO while you was with a friend and the friend, it was, it was meant for the friend, you know, that sighting or this abduction experience, but you happened to be there. It's almost like once you've been touched by the phenomena, I don't know whether the phenomena is watching you or whether you suddenly become open and knowledge, not knowledgeable, but you all knowing that this is real and, so, and you're more accepting. And maybe there's something happening in our minds that we obviously we can't not can't understand. Well, do you think this all links to uh, like we've had guests on on our show here where um, the, the family believe that we have a guardian angel sat on our shoulders, more or less? Uh, well, well you, uh, you know, a, a guardian angel could let's well not. I'm reluctant to say aliens, but a guardian angel could be an alien. A guardian angel could be a being of a higher intelligence. Uh, a guardian angel could be exactly that, and it's just the Bible's interpretation of what these beings are. Do you know, the, uh, yeah, people yeah. people of religion would argue with us and say, no, that's what it is. But we'll just jump back to what I said earlier, and I, 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 like I liked it, we've got to consider everything unless you know everything. And, do you know what I mean? Yeah, because I like like when people do talk about guardian an angels, they talk about experiences where they've had like um, reassurance words, soothing words said to them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not nothing in malice or or anything like that. So yeah, you know, you know I mean, jumping from that, I weren't gonna. I, I don't mean I weren't gonna talk about this because because I thought I shouldn't, but. <clears throat> When you, you brought the subject of angels up, there were a, a lovely lady called Annie contacted me several years ago, and she she was terminally ill, and she she wanted to just send me an, a, 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 her observations and a, and her thoughts on an experience that she had many years before. And I haven't got any details in front of me, but what basically she was a single mum again, and working hard, and she'd got a one son. And I think his, his son was in his late teens, early 20s, and she received a phone call saying he'd had a catastrophic stroke. And it, it, and it, it may not even pull through, you know, and obviously she, her life centred around this boy. And, uh, and I spoke to Annie and, you know, when somebody's telling you something like this and this lady were terminally ill, telling me this story, she said... Uh, I was at his bedside, I was praying. She says, I never used to pray. I was praying that he'd survive. I was praying that he'd pull through. She says, and now when I went home one night after being in hospital, after seeing him, because the, the, the prognosis was he might not pull through. And if he did, he's, gonna, he's not gonna be 100% to what he was before. She says, I woke up in the night and she sent me a drawing. I've not, I've not included this in any books and I'm, I, I, it will be in a book when I write about it. And she's drawn this being. 
she says, and the drawing shows a dressing table in the corner of the room and kind of a, a look at the outline of her bed. And there's a huge figure that's nearly touching the ceiling. Great big shoulders. And she said, it brings back to her. She said, it's glowing. It's just, just, it's just absolutely glowing. She said, I'm looking at it and I can't take, it's got like page boy style air. She said, I couldn't take my eyes off. It's golden air. And she said, it spoke to her. And it said, everything's going to be all right. And she asked it if it could turn around. He says, if I turned around and you saw me in my full form, it would kill you. And I've heard this before. And I don't know. Only a few weeks ago, somebody were talking to me about this. And if somebody were talking about if you look into the, the, the eyes of this being and not the one that we're on about now. But that's what it said to her. The next morning, she receives a phone call. He's come out of his coma. He's not made a full recovery, but he's leading a, an happy and well-functioning life, or he was up until a few years ago when I, when I last spoke to Annie. But, so is that the same thing, only we've we'd actually seen a glimpse of it? I don't know. Uh, I, I just find it fascinating that, that, that there's, there's intelligences around us that we're not even aware of. And uh, it, it's a frightening thought as well that they're watching your every move, potentially. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, I, I guess no, uh, if, it's, I am. <laughs> if you take the concepts, what you've just said, that will kind of like be monitored 24-7 for a bit, want for a better phrase, then, uh, so these things, what we see with our eyes, right, this is our interpretation, or is it, do you think it's an interpretation, an interpretation projected from these beings? I don't, you see, is it our interpretation or is it I, I think, projected from, I, I th from I that? I think that maybe, to simplify it, they're playing good cop, bad cop, because in some instances, maybe people are getting answers and messages. It's almost like Christmas Carol, when when he got visited and told how mean he was and what he was doing wrong kind of thing. We know that's really simplifying it, but where did that story come from? Where did, you know, Lewis, Lewis Carroll, I, oh, oh, uh, anyway... <laughs> You know, you know, it's just, it's. I, I just find it fascinating, and I'd, I'd, I'd welcome anybody's views on that, or anybody that's had a taste of one of these voices, as we'll call it, from the outer nowhere. And yeah, I don't know whether we've got any questions in, but we can uh, carry on. We'll just let it roll. Yeah, well, we'll have a look. Can you see the questions, Paul? Can you uh, see well, anything on there? Well, I've watched them rolling up, but I'm not monitoring. Yeah, them. I'll just. Uh, you, no, you know. I'm just going to see what's. Uh, yeah, I think Sky sent me something through. Just switched over pages. Not Sky, uh, Alison, I should say. It's Alison sending me the questions tonight. Um, right then, Steve O71. Steve has Wolflands changed any of your previous opinions on the paranormal? And this one's for Les. Um, has it changed uh, my opinions? I didn't really have a firm opini opinion to start with. Uh, I wasn't uh, um, a nurse here or uh, in, 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 you know, or fully on board with it. So it's whatever I, I experienced at the time that we went to um, w with all these witnesses. And um, <coughs> yeah, um, there, there were some oppressive feelings when was out in the forest that I can't, I can't deny that. But, uh, but have, I, have I gone one way or the other on it? I'm, I'm at, I'll accept anything, you know, and uh, I'm not the prime witness here, and that's what I've got to remember. It's these people on the other end of the camera or the microphone or what have you. These are the prime witnesses, and I've just got to listen to what they say. Mm -hmm. So, basically, uh, that's where I am on that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. so I'll just... Uh, have you got anything I'd say on that one, Paul? Well, yeah, I, I, not, not a great deal. I mean, that's your opinion, and I, I respect that, Les. Uh, for me... The people that have seen these things, because don't forget that we spoke to lots of other people that aren't included in Wolflands. The, the sincerity of these witnesses is uh, it's absolutely brilliant. And, I'm, and I sound like a broken record. None of them are connected to each other, unless the ones who've experienced it as a group, you know, the three, and we've got two of them that have come on camera. They're not connected to each other in any way. And they're all singing from similar in sheet. They're all talking about similar feelings that they're getting when they've seen these things, and most of it's fear. And for the most yeah, part, yeah. Well, that's that. That's something what I could have added there, Paul. Is uh, is that the sincerity as as it me has come through me? 
you know, otherwise, um, you know, I might as well just pack my bags and, and walk out the forest mm. if, uh, it, you know, if they didn't have uh, a story that, you know, it needs further investigation. I, I just throw my hat in the ring every time. I believe what I'm being told. Does that make me gullible? If it does, then I'm sorry, because I don't do it with everybody and I don't do it with everything. Don't forget people, less people. I, I went into this subject of the cryptids writing the first Truth Proof book, that one, with no interest whatsoever in, in that part of unexplained phenomena. That was brought to me by people's accounts and I've just slowly got drawn into it and now it's as fascinating as everything else within the full spectrum of what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, let's have a look then. I've got Lisa Rod. Um, tell us, uh, Paul, about the weird creatures climbing the cliffs. Uh, heard you on the Howard You show. Yeah, yeah, hi Lisa, and I'm not sure that I ever said that there were weird creatures climbing cliffs. What I probably said was, well, I don't believe they could climb the cliffs. Uh, you know, we're talking about 150 to 400 foot cliffs, these sort of sheer, sheer cliff faces, with loads of caves below, and I don't think I've ever said at any point that they've climbed cliffs. I know that when me and Andy Ramsden back in 2017 saw that animal on the cliff top, I said it was on the edge of the cliff and it just sprung up. And I think people have taken from that that I'm saying it's come up the cliff. I don't believe that for one second. I don't believe it any more, Lisa, than I believe that these things are living in the caves or somehow forging an existence in some remote, untouched area of eastern North Yorkshire. We might talk about these forests being 525 square miles of forest moor and wood, but I don't think they're there. Do I believe the real? Yes. But it's transient. Whatever it is, it's, it's entering and it's in and out of our reality it, like ghosts. It, it's fabulous. We've, we've not actually touched on anybody being injured by these things. But so if you want to expand on that lisa I, I, i'm willing to i'm willing to talk more about it but I, when i say climbing the cliffs when i spoke on howard's show last week we did a few podcasts uh, i'm pretty sure that i said you know there's a massive cave systems b below Fl flambra bempton and buckton but and but i don't think they're climbing the cliffs there you go yeah, Jojo is asking us, uh, Paul and Les, any news on release date for Wolflands? And uh, I can probably speak for Paul. Yeah, we have it, not yeah. got We have not got release date as yet. Uh, they're still in uh, music production. But at the it, it, it is nice to be able to say that we aren't filming anymore. And, uh, you know, it, I, even music's mammoth. I think that's, uh, that's a huge chunk of uh, uh, one hour, 30 minutes of film that they're doing. And... I know that Mick Park and Nick are working on it, as are Nick, my son-in-law, and my daughter, and they're working from back, from front, and they're going to meet in middle. Obviously, they're sharing all the components, so we're not going to get some kind of disjointed, it sounds different at this end, but there you go. Johnny Appleseed, Appleseed is asking, hey guys, how and when did you and Les meet and start together? Do you want to run with that one, Paul? I, well, I th you'll probably remember better than me, but we, I don't know. We've been sort of, we, we know we've been we've been doing stuff on and off now at least four years, haven't we, Les? Probably five? Is it longer? Yeah, five, yeah. Five years. It was, uh, uh, right, I'll, I'll just put a little bit more clarity on that. Uh, 2017, I approached Paul, and uh, because I had seen, believe it or not, his video that he did with, um, who, did, who did he do it with? Richard that, D. Hall. That, Richard D. Hall, yeah. that's it, yeah. And I was gobsmacked. And I thought, well, I don't live far from Paul. I'm very, very interested in the subject. I, we were, and we still do run a, a Facebook page called East Yorkshire TV. So I wanted to do a short interview with Paul to feature on East Yorkshire TV. And um, and that's kind of met up, and then um, things. Yeah, we've done lots of things together. Paul, Loads of things. I mean, there's the, and and some of footage that's not in Wolflands. I mean, the film's an hour and a half long, but I'm not joking. There's hours and hours of footage and things that we've tried, and and I don't mean Les has failed on. I've failed on. We've failed. We've done. We've and put loads of effort into it, and not and and it's it's. It's probably been good, but it's just not been appropriate. But we've tried it. 
You, you know, I mean, I bet people are sick of saying, when is it due, this film? When is it due? And <laughs> you, you, Christ, the amount of time. I mean, we could have made really 10 films, but it's just the way things have run. And I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be worth it when we, you know, when it is come to, when it does come to fruition. Yeah, I think they've had five, uh, no, <laughs> six, six Bond films out since we started. Six James Bond yeah, films. Yeah, I were only 13 we when we started yeah. this. But uh, put put hairs on your yeah, chest. Yeah, but but uh, Richard D. Hall. So that were the Wolds UFOs, if people didn't know, and it'll still be on internet. I think if anybody wants to look at it, it is. Yeah, it'll be on YouTube. And Richard, what Richard had been doing, because uh, I know there'll be people in chat familiar with Richard D. Hall, he'd been corresponding with a guy up on the walls, a farmer up on the walls, who I happen to know very very well. And this guy, I've said it before, I think he's got more UFO footage than anybody, certainly in this country. And and, and I bet you he's as much as anybody in the world. He's got cameras running day and night on cams, sweeping cams in all windows of his home, upstairs windows of his home. And he's captured lots and lots of things from Staxton. Uh, Staxton Wall, the right at the top that overlooks Sledmere and the, the overlook ev everywhere, full 360. And he contacted me years ago, and I've seen a lot of his footage. And me and Steve Ashbridge have been on walls, and he's rang up and he said, "This is happening here." And we've kind of looked, and he's right, and we, we're in conversations on his film and on phone as he's filming us. Well, he'd contacted Richard. I'll not keep this drawn out. It's you know, it's a short story. Richard came through for a few days. Basically, he wouldn't go through with it. I showed him the footage, but he wouldn't go on film. I were in Dane's Dyke having a walk with my wife and little dog, and uh, I get a phone call out at Blue saying, would I come and do it? And I drove straight through from Dane's Dyke. That's why when you watch that film, you'll see a white van. That was my white works van. So everything were off the cuffs. So I just sort of give it that. There were nothing planned or rehearsed. And the footage was mine, actually, because he wouldn't, he wouldn't even let him use footage. Uh, which was sad, really, but uh, after getting somebody to come and, and sort of stay for a few days. But there you go. So that's the Richard D. Hall one, the Wolds UFOs. And on another note, uh, Russell Callahan, who a lot of people might know, former editor of UFO Data magazine, contacted me this morning uh, with the most fabulous UFO sighting. Once again, spheres of light. And uh, straight after sighting, he did a little voice recording to me. Paul, I think I've just seen your spheres of light. And I, I'm not going to give location away just yet. And, and it's Russell's sighting anyway. So it, we might get Russell on to talk about this and some of his other uh, thoughts on the subject of UFOs because he's got a vast knowledge. And what I like about it, this sighting's quite blown him away. And if anybody's met Russell Callahan, great guy, he's quite sceptical. He really, he really does push for the truth of everything in, a, in the normal sense. So for him to be sh taken back by what he's seen, I, I think it's really good. Anybody that knows Russell, or if he's, he gets in here now, add to it. Right, I'm, go I'm going to move on to... Uh, fascinating that, Paul, by the way. <laughs> no, nice. uh, it, it really is. And uh, as you'll say, he's, he's, he's one for the nitty-gritty. Oh, yeah, he really uh, is, yeah. Wants to see the bolts, nuts and bolts of everything. Um I'm just going to move on to a fascinating story. And I, I, funny enough, I was talking to a member of my family who remembers this case being in the papers at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the the Balmston Drain uh, UFO uh, landing in 1970. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? Na 1970. Yeah. We, yeah, we, is that right? You know, it is right, yeah. And Balmston Drain, everybody knows runs through Hull, Les probably knows as much or more about the Barmston drain than me, and it finishes, it enters the sea at the little seaside area of Barmston, about six miles up the coast from where I'm sat now. So, 1970, he thinks it's September now, early September. Now, this becomes more fascinating for me, because early September, off the coast of Bempton and Flamborough, we have the lightning allegedly pursuing the UFO over the North Sea, September the 8th, Lightning XS XS eight nine four, uh, allegedly UFO related. Let's, you know, I mean, there's a lot to suggest that UFOs were being seen. I mean, we've got this incredible story. This guy came to see me just before Christmas to buy some books. He were in area and rang up and asked if he could buy the Truth Proof books. 
And then we had a talk for, a, well, a very long talk. And he told me about this sighting. I asked him why he was interested in the subject. So as a young boy, aged, I don't know, about 15 years old, he's playing on the Barmston drain. And he's with three other boys. There's four of them. It's, it's not dark, but it's, it's early evening. And uh, it's a, they meet another group of boys from a different part of Hull. Well, what the 15, 14, 15 and 16 year olds do if they don't know them, they kind of clash. He said, so we ended up in a bit of a scrap and we chased these other boys away. And we ended up in an area, that, they weren't lost, but where they wouldn't normally be. And they're walking back and it's, it's not dark, but it's just getting dark. And he... He kind of explained, he said, you know, the, the drain in various places is up to 20 foot wide, depending on rainfall. Sometimes it's only two or three foot wide and it varies from, from two foot deep to six foot deep, maybe deeper in places if they've had heavy rain. Let's say it's 23 miles of, of man-made drainage cut out in the 1700s to, to stop the low lane areas of Hull flooding. And I'm sure people in Hull will be able to tell us a little bit more about that. So, right, where am I going with he is 15 years old, he's with the group of other boys, and he, he, he says that on the way back, one of them caught sight of a light in the sky, and they all looked up, and it's hurtling down towards them, said it's elliptical shaped, and it's bright white, but not so bright that he can't see a solid black shape in, in the middle of it, and it literally smashed down into the drain at the side of them threw water up everywhere this light he said and it was just about as wide as the drain 15 to 20 foot wide this thing straight into water water everywhere it's all sort of moving about and then when it settles down there's, there's nothing it's gone they immediately look on the other side of the bank and there's a man stood on the other side at bank and he's got don't forget these are young boys they've not got any comparisons to draw and they said it looked like a flight suit shiny dark brown shiny or dark or black suit plastic or leather full suit and a hat a leather hat like a flight hat with black goggles or, or some black apparatus on his eyes he's not making no gestures towards them he's ignoring them and he's got in his hand an oblong box and he's got it in both hands and he's putting it up and down side to side he says and there's lights flashing everywhere on this box and they, they were they're fascinated they, they, you know all of this is happening people r r let's let's get this right all of this is happening from i don't know this light hurtling to earth landing looking then seeing him it's not we're not talking a great length of time and they're watching this guy or this being, what, what was he? I don't know, a spaceman? I don't know. So one of them, I don't know whether it was our witness, Glenn, or whether it was one of the other three boys alerted them to, in the, to the dike and they momentarily took their eyes off this man and they said there was an orange glow started to come in the water and it got brighter and brighter and brighter and then just burst out of the water and literally it had gone. That, that that that's what happened they looked onto the bank and the man's gone so you know he, he said that it's a bit you've just said that i didn't realize that you spoke about it to your to your to your boy your, your ladlers that uh, he said that it were in papers that people had seen a ufo people were reporting seeing a ufo well they saw it up close and personal quite literally didn't they do you know what i mean so yeah, well, it was my wife actually. Yeah, who really? uh, remembers oh. the press. Yes. Uh, Do you know what it? If a memory serves her properly, like I mean, it's fifty. What fifty three years ago? Yeah. Do you know what fascinated yeah. me? It sounded like something from a Terminator movie. The splash yeah. down and then the man. <laughs> Do you know? What yeah. It, Did I mean you've got to ask the obvious question here, Paul? I know they're only young boys. What how old? What was I? Fifteen years old. Yeah. Yeah. So did he experience any missing time? No. After that, they they, they kind of went home. And, and went about their business and I'm not sure that they talked to many people about it. I don't, I think they were more excited than stunned to silence. Do you know what I mean? It's it, it, fabulous. But, you know, we've got, we've got that happening. And then we, in the same month, we've got this UFO report over the North Sea and this, the lightning aircraft that allegedly crashed pursuing this UFO. 
uh, September 8th, 1970. And the Balmston Drain from Flamborough, uh, we don't know exactly where on Balmston Drain, so, but let's assume we're looking 35 miles away, Les, 30 miles. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so it's not a great distance compared to compared to a distance as a jet aircraft could travel 30 miles in, in minutes. Uh, well, go on. yeah. Yeah, well, I'll just say for anybody who does look on the map and see where Bamston Drain goes, as Paul said, it runs from through Hull and up to Bamston, the village of Bamston, which is uh, south of uh, of, your, of your town, isn't it, yeah, Paul? Yeah. And um, but, um, when you look on the map, and it might not, it's probably of any coincidence or, or or what I don't know, but there is there is right near Bamston Drain, there there is a burial mound. And uh, the you know the burial mound obviously uh, from built put there whenever. Well, uh, that'll be probably Neolithic, Les. Uh, yeah. I think there's a, I think the mound you're on about is. Uh, is yeah. Has, do you remember me? Uh, yeah. Remember me telling you about think, the mound? Yeah. And I yeah. think it's also got a, a circle of elm trees around it or something. That's right. You know? Yeah. So, and I think there was some controversy because somebody wanted to take them down yeah, or cut them perhaps. down or whatever. It, it's interesting that you get a lot of sightings and strange happenings around the earthworks which we've touched on before but just to say we're 1970 <clears throat> the Bamston drain ufo and the strange man i don't we don't know what he was we don't know whether he was a spaceman <laughs> I, I don't know but you know we've got we've got this incredible story then we've got the story of the lightning allegedly pursuing the ufo over the north sea and then there's there's another one i think you brought it to my attention uh, that or you, you knew something about it. I, I told you about the farmer up on the cliff tops, we'll not say his name, whose dad had to plow out the landing traces of a UFO in early 1970, uh, in September 1970. And uh, men in suits come from military and ordered him to plow the traces of this thing that had landed. And then I connected it then to the former butcher of Flamborough, Dean, Dean Bolton, who told me as schoolboys, they went up to see where the UFO landed on the cliff tops. So there's lots of things connected that suggest something of a, an highly unusual nature took place in East Yorkshire in September of 1970, as well as all the other information that researchers and people who'd witnessed things and wrote to the papers of the day put in that strongly added more meat to the bone of a true UFO encounter over the North Sea in 1970. And then we've got this incredible, I think this is as, in, I think this is as interesting as the lightning pursuing a UFO over the North Sea. Here we've got three young men, we'll say, teenagers, 15 year olds, 14, 16, I don't know. He said he was 15. <clears throat> and they've seen something like this, it's incredible. <laughs> I just find it fascinating. Yeah, and uh, to be honest, I think, Probably at that age myself, uh, I was interested in the UFOs then, and uh, I was just hoping to see something myself. Yeah. At uh, that age, you, you know. Why uh, weren't you the chased one? Uh, that probably in the wrong place. Yeah, <laughs> I lived in the same town as them, but obviously in the wrong spot. Uh, so yeah. Oh. Okay then, I'll just see if uh, you want to take any more uh, questions Price there, Paul. Let's see what we've got, and there. Uh, yeah, um, thanks for Alison for sending these through. Uh, we've got the oh, the Sherwood Dowser. What what do you think of the Mexi Mexican president's elf photo? Do you know anything I, about I've, that? I have no knowledge of it, and uh, I, I'm sorry to say. So I've, I've, I've said before, yeah. I'm not ashamed to say I do live in a little bubble. Les mentioned the uh, the, the recent footage of the UFOs and the the sh the shoot down of the alleged UFOs. Apart from just breezing over it, I've not really got too heavily involved looking at it. And I know there's some brilliant podcasts out there that deal with all the latest paperwork that's been released and everything else. And I've spoke on some of them, not about that. But I, th I think to myself about all these latest government disclosure and all these papers that we're reading and all the views. How do we know we're not being lied to about them? You know, we've, we're fighting to get this yeah. information. How do we know that we're not being lied to about that? You know, it's everybody jumps up and down and thinks, God, we're going to get some kind of absolute disclosure now because they're starting to talk about it. We're only told what they want us to know. Um, that's my opinion. And uh, 
we're, I think we're still a long way from disclosure. <clears throat> Uh, Steve O seventy one, Paul, are you aware of the the Carmel or Cam Camille? You were four four two. Do you have an opinion? Is the, uh, if we're I don't know a, anything about uh, that. Paul. Well, I probably got it wrong, Steve. Or say a yes in chat if I've got it right. Are we talking about the the Scottish one, the one that, with the wedge shaped object that was filmed by the alleged uh, walkers? I can't even remember the date. I think it were on Nick Pope's wall in his office when he used to work for. To Minister of Defence, uh, no opinion to be honest, mate. I I, I couldn't say either way. I, only, I think the only people that will know are the people that took the photograph or the people that. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> Lee Roscoe is asking. Uh, well, he's not asking. It's not a question actually. He's just pointing out that they. I think he's talking about the Patterson camera, you know the Patterson. Yeah, and, Patterson Gimlin footage. Uh, Gimlin, uh, the camera was taken on a Kodak K. 100 single lens, 25 millimeter extra lens. Okay, I know last week, or well, we was talking about it last we're week. We're talking about it last week, late. and yeah. it, it is interesting that people have said to me, Well, you're going up onto clifftops with all this electronic equipment, camera mm. equipment, you're not going to catch these things. Or if you're going mm. into the forest, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever type of phenomena, you're not going to because you know they can detect it. That's probably. It probably got a good point, whereas the Patterson Gimlin footage, that I think it was Barton Nunley that were talking about it, saying that he didn't yeah. believe it was genuine. Um, mm. But that were taken on sort of bog standard equipment that weren't state of the art electronic gear, weren't it? I want, yeah, I wonder if it was a battery operated a camera or, or a, a still a wound up camera. I don't know. No, somebody might be able to tell us. And uh, yeah. as I say, I'm not going to say that I think the footage is fake. I'm not going to say it's genuine. I don't know. And uh, it's just like the stuff that I'm filming up there. You're always going to get some people saying you faked it. It's CGI, or you know, well, I can't go to about it. And I'm not, and I, I don't even want to argue with people about it. If that's your opinion, that, that that's their opinion. Go with it. Consider everything. I love that one now, unless you already know everything, which most people do. That that's want to tell gonna, me what to do. That's your new tagline, <laughs> Paul. Uh, Tony, yeah, Tony D is asking, uh, what is the most credible UK dogmen? Dogman sighting you know of? Oh, we had a doubt. Uh, without a doubt, Brock's a forest. And, uh, and I only don't include Cropton and Stape because we're not sure it were a dogman because some of the attributes that this man described, the gamekeeper, don't, it sounds more like a Bigfoot. Brock's a forest. <clears throat> two, two brilliant witnesses describing something that, that honestly could have just stepped from a horror film. Uh, is it roaming and living in that forest? I, I doubt it. Is it real? 100%. I believe it is, yeah. Right then. Uh, I'll just move on from the questions. Great questions, by the way. Yeah, and thank uh, you. Thanks, for send, thanks for sending these in. Well, it's saving me using my brain. Uh, so I'd please send me some more. <laughs> Okay then, I think yeah. What I think what I'm going to talk about now is the uh, Hornsea creature sighting in 1988, Paul. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you can and, just and, run with that yeah, one. Yeah, and I can just see a question there, but we'll we'll touch on. Is it Patricia Adams' rights question after this? If we can, or, or anybody else's? Yeah, that's good. So 1988. Yeah. And I this guy emailed me a few years ago, and. Uh, with the sighting and I, I sort of connected with him then never wrote about this because it, it, sometimes we have to separate a sighting from an experience and sometimes experience is more frightening than the actual seeing the object you know uh, if that kind of makes sense it, it, it the reason I, I got in touch was it reminds me very much of our witness at Scalby Mills as experience and his encounter with something unknown and un that he couldn't see on the cliff tops at Scalby Mills. So this is 1998, and he tells me he was 17 at the time. I spoke to him at length this week as well, <clears throat> because somebody came to me with a story of a Bigfoot running across the road at Driffield. What? Amazing. You know, I don't mean in town, by the way, people, but that's what they told me they'd seen, and I thought, this is too much of a coincidence that we've got close proximity, Driffield, Hornsey, this one's the the Driffield ones within within eighteen months to two years. This is nineteen ninety eight, and what he's done is seventeen years old. He's been in the town, 
with his friends, doing what he wants to do, just young teenagers doing whatever they want. He said he often found himself walking home very late, as in the early hours of the morning. And uh, <clears throat> he walked about three miles home to Seaton. So if, I think Les will know where this is. And uh, I'm not familiar with Seaton. I'm familiar with Hornsey. He said, but there's, there's the, the road between Hornsey and Seaton, about three miles. And obviously it's about 3 a.m. in the morning. He says, there's nobody on the road. So it's all actually walking in middle of the road. Not out of fear. I th- 17 year old, he probably just felt like in, invincible. Do you know what I mean? But he said, but I'm walking home. It's been a good night with my friends. I mean, Bidlet Road. And he becomes aware of something in, uh, near the mirror, at the side of the mirror, crashing and crashing and bashing through the undergrowth, breaking branches, breaking foliage. And kind of instantly struck a chord with the, the Scalby Mills report that we've got in Wolflands. That's the first thing that he became aware of. He said, so from middle at road, I moved to right hand side at road because I'm anticipating something coming out like a couple of cows or a bull. So he says, that's the kind of impact it were having. He says, and I'm, I'm wondering what it is. He said, I've just walked around the, around the first bend at Bro- let me, Brockle Home. Do you know where this is, Les? I'm, I'm not sure where Brockle Home is. I don't know where uh, that and is. And I'm Paul, approaching man. the second right bend. He says, and as I'm approaching it, I heard a, this noise in the undergrowth near the mirror. I'm, I'm walking, as he said, to the other side of the road. I've reached apex at Bend. He says, and there's a there's a large tree, and it's some of its bow a beech tree, and some of its boughs are quite low, but it's big. We're not talking a sapling. He said, and something unseen grabbed hold of the tree, and this tree was shaking. He says, I could see all the leaves vibrating, and then it started howling and whooping. Now, it, it said he'd been since listened to noises, sounds like the Sierra sounds, uh, sounds of Bigfoot. He says, and it literally sounded like that. He says, I could feel the impact of its voice. It's the, the, this discharge of energy that were coming from this thing's mouth inside my chest. So it was absolutely terrifying. He says, and I took the decision to run. He says, I can't even remember when he said but i just set off running and this thing's whooping and howling and the tree's shaking he says and i could feel some this is it's not really funny but this is a bit that's what he added to it he says i could feel some banging on my backside he says and i didn't know what it was at first he said i was that terrified and then i realized it were my heels he says i were i were that i were running that fast my my heels were hitting my backside he said i i, I just don't like it what happening he said but I was I absolutely terrified. He says he didn't stop running till he got past Shirley's garage. I don't know where Shirley's garage is, people. Uh, I'm assuming it might have long since gone. This is 19, 1988. But, uh, yeah, it, uh, it, I told a few of his friends. Uh, nobody believed him. And, uh, yeah, that's about, that's about where we are with the, the Hornsey Bigfoot, mm. the other one. It, and, mm. and I haven't got the full details of this, although I have spoke to the guy a few times. I want to write it up and get it so it's, it's kind of coherent and flows in my head. But it basically crossed the road in front of his car. He said, and it was like a huge black flash, to the shape of a bear. He said, the first thing that came into my mind was Bigfoot. Yeah. And it was huge, you know, and this is a daylight sighting. And this is a guy who's got a qualified, works in a highly responsible job. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm pretty sure he's going to let me use his name. And uh, I, I can use this guy's name with Auntie one if I wanted to. I don't think there's any need at the moment, but uh, you know, I don't want to just set, set anybody up for ridicule. Uh, and even if they believe they're telling me the truth, it's if they can avoid that, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that at all costs. So, yeah, yeah. any views on that, people? You know, let's, yeah. let's be hearing them. No, yeah, that's a very interesting story. Is that one very interesting account? Is that one, Paul? How many uh, accounts do you think? Uh... I know what you're going to say. As relation to where uh, these creatures will call them, mm-hmm. whether dogmen, Bigfoot, uh, uh, or whatever. Told. No, how many uh, are actually percentage are actually multiple witnesses? Do you think? Uh, I know we've dealt with the multiple witnesses. If you just well, said, they're uh, out there, Les, aren't they? Let's face it, yeah. they're out there. But I will say that I think a lot of the the, the things that happen within the unexplained genre, the unexplained world if that's one way of terming it, 
I think a lot of the things that happen do seem to target individuals in lonely places or in yeah. it, 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 the dead of night. I mean, I don't, why does 3am seem to figure so much in across all the full spectrum? 3am, people often report that they've had a weird experience. What time was it? Can you tell me? It was just after 3am. 3am seems to be a, a time that comes up quite often. Um, uh, and dates, June. Lord, you know, it just stands out. June is a date that comes up on the in East Yorkshire for the unexplained, for me. Certain locations, you know, it's... Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. Well, it, it brings me back to the account that we featured at Christmas time uh, uh, with an experience uh, who was out uh, out for the night with his uh, two other friends in Wancliffe Woods, was it? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, that was experienced by all three, but but only one of them wants to speak publicly about it, and he came on our stream, didn't he? That's anymore. right, yeah, and uh, we changed his name, and I can't remember what we changed his name to, so I'm not going to say, because I might end up saying his real name. He won't thank me for that, but you're, you're spot on. And what's interesting, that one, 19, uh, that one 1987, I think, this guy's yeah. citing, 1988. And and uh, for anybody who doesn't know where Wancliffe Woods is, I think it's just uh, a wood just outside of Sheffield in the UK. Yeah. Yeah, so not far, really. I mean, to be honest, in this northern UK part we're in, from east to west, what, how many miles are you talking about? You tell from, me. From here to, from here to, to Blackpool, say. It's somebody in the chat can give me... Uh, <laughs> mileage on that one. Yeah. Is it, and, would, uh, I, would I be right? 250 miles? 250 miles. Nothing. Would I be right? Oh, what? Probably miles out there. Anybody in the chat wants to put me right on that one. But the point here is that, yes, we've been working in the in the North Yorkshire um, uh, woodland area, and um, which is what works out what square mileage. What About is it? 525. Four, 500, yeah. 525, yeah. yeah. You know, and you, and you kind of add that again, really. A uh, amount. And uh, really, you're at the other side of the country, mm. just about, aren't you? So uh, it's, it's, we're not talking of a real big area, but there's there's lots and lots of people having these sightings and experiences. Uh, and I bet that that for every report we get, and I'm, and I don't think we're exaggerating here. Obviously, I don't know percentages, but I bet you there's fifty and sixty reports that we're not getting for every one that we're getting, and a lot of the best reports are going to go to the grave with people and if and if people anybody listening to this and you've got an interest because we know and i know that everybody who goes to conferences everybody that listens to live streams like this are looking for answers or, or, yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. you're probably looking yeah. for answers because you've had a strange experience yourself and if the only reason that you're not talking about those strange experiences is the fact that you, you're absolutely frightened that that you might get exposed and you've kept it uh, you know, and, and your identity known, and you've kept it quiet for all those years for that very reason, it wouldn't happen here. I can assure you. And not only that, there's other reasons. Uh, there's a there's a couple who claim to have been abducted on the cliff tops, and I've 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 met them once, and I doubt I'll meet them again. They're terrified that this is going to re- that talk, even talking about it's going to evoke what happened to them again. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's yeah. a multitude of reasons why people won't share some of this. Oh, yeah, it's just abject fear, isn't it, yeah. Paul, as you'll say. OK, we'll move on a little bit then, Paul, because I, I know I, I've I did got... see, a, not a question, but I did, as, as it were going up, and so if it pops up in questions, Sky or Alison, just omit this one. Somebody said that 3am is the witching hour, and uh, if, if you want to elaborate on that, but I, I, all I know is that uh, I, I do realise that a lot of things happen at 3am or around that hour in I think, the report. Yeah. I think it was at this point you wanted to get a question in from per, Patricia Adams, right? I, don't know I ain't it got is. it in front of me. I don't. I've not got it in front of me as yet. Just let me scroll through and see if uh, it's been sent through. No worries. We, we, we still get. Was through. it? A, was it about government circles? Paul? I, I don't know. I just saw no. a question from from Pat, and she's she's always supports us. She always comes in uh, in in chat. As well, everybody does. Well, I'll go with that. Qu- I'll go with that question. What she's asked them, seeing as uh, we're. Uh... Well, I hope I can answer it now, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul and Les, is there a- anyone in the government circles you trust, or are fighting the truth? Is anybody on our side in the government? Do you think, Paul? 
who was um, that's, that's a good, who was supporting and a good looking into this. Question and, and isn't it a weak answer to say I, I don't know because who who can you trust? Do you know what I mean? Has everybody got a price pack? Uh, basically, it's it's a that's a difficult one, isn't it? Who do we trust? You know, uh, let's assume that, that somebody who's worked on the UFO desk and that now they're suddenly talking about UFOs openly. How do we know that? Uh, I don't mean that these people are plants and they're just they're just giving information out to mislead the public. I'm not saying that's what's happening. But how do we know that that hasn't happened in some instances? It, it's hard. We had Rick Doty on on the live stream and he'd, he'd worked in high places within the, the American establishment, should we say. And a lot of what he had to say back in the day, or a lot of what he was involved in was misle to mislead people. So Rick's come out and started talking about these things. And, I, and for anybody that doesn't like Rick, I'm, I, to be honest with you, in my personal opinion, I really did like Rick. I met him at the awakening and I got on great with him and, and I found him okay. But how do we know that Rick is not misleading us now? Uh, uh, is he still working for government? I don't know. You know, I don't want to label Rick and you just... Uh, short answer, I don't know, Pat. Yeah, well, I've got a short answer for that as well, Paul, which is not probably just keep turning this fire off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mind your trousers, you don't catch no, fire. No. Um, and uh, I just think that uh, there's really nobody who wants this to be out there. So I don't think A, there's going to be anybody fighting in government circles to get this the truth out, as you'll put it, Pat. And I think they're just like everything else uh, that the government mo government know and we don't know. They just like to keep everything in a little, little box. Yeah. And that's it. Well, look at, look at <clears throat> Rendlesham and look at Lord Hill Norton. He was the Admiral of the Fleet. He came out in support of the UFO, UFO hypothesis that this was a U, real UFO-related event. And look what people suddenly started saying. The guy's a lunatic. He's a crackpot. You know, he doesn't know what he's saying. He, you know, he, 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 basically saying that he were unhinged. This guy was Admiral at Fleet. And so, God help us if if we've got a man who's unhinged. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it was were they only saying that because he was saying things that nobody wanted him to say? You know, he was just one of the higher echelons of power that stuck his head above the parapet. I think he probably was. Well, I think it's not unlike a lot of other big events that have happened in the last three years around the world, and people. Uh, people in power just want to put other people into the fringes mm. and to dismiss them, don't they? Yeah, yeah, very true. Okay, when we're going next, then, Paul, well, are we it, going up to well, the? Do um, we have any more questions? Or, or are we? We're at eight. No, I'm going. I'm going on to um, eight o'clock now, Les. Are we going to talk about anything? Oh, uh, yeah, we've got a little. Um, I've got a little video to play uh, and a little bit of a uh, bit of advertising to do. Okay. So just we'll play this us. one. Just bear with us. Twenty seconds. And you can watch Paul again. Hello, Paul Sinclair here. And I'd just like to say that I'm very much looking forward to speaking at the Forbidden Knowledge World Tour in conjunction with the Awakening Expo in Manchester this year. The conference takes place on the 25th to the 27th of August. And at the conference, I will be talking about my own experiences from childhood to present day. I look forward to seeing old and new faces Let's make it a fabulous weekend for all involved. Thank you. So, there we go. We'll get the right screen on for everybody. There we go. So, a little advert for the Awakening Conference <coughs> in Manchester this year. Get your tickets, Paul Sinclair, and lots and lots of other great uh, speakers on that uh, tour. Okay, so where do you want to go next, Paul? Then, well, I'd like to ask before, while we're just we're just on the uh, awakening conference, that in a few weeks' time we're planning to do another Zoom chat, like we did probably what just before Christmas with Don Lodge. Don kind of chaired it, and myself and Les, and I think there were probably thirty people in the Zoom. It was brilliant, and, and it was good, and it were audience—not audience. It was just people within the chat's participation. So everybody had got as much to say as what I've got, Les has got. Some people didn't get the questions in, uh, and I don't think anything was done deliberate. It was just the way 
everything just flowed. It was good. Well, you've always got you've always got time constraints, haven't you, Paul? Yeah. So. so I spoke to Don today, and he asked me, "Did we want to do another one?" Well, I know Les would like yeah. to do one. So mm -hmm. what we're basically asking is, uh, because we can only get between. I might be being ambitious here. I know we can get thirty, but we'd probably go up to fifty. Don will tell me if we can't, or he might say even more or less. I don't know, but uh, we want to just get a, an opinion of who'd be interested in doing one of these Zoom chats, or do you prefer this? If so, we'll do a Zoom chat on another night. Uh, what's the opinion of people within the chat? You can message us afterwards. You don't have to just message us here. But what's your views on it, Les? Yeah, uh, as I said, uh, just said earlier, brilliant. I enjoyed it very, very much. Uh, I didn't know what to expect, but when uh, we'd gone through it all, it was uh, I enjoyed it. And I'm sure everybody who came on and participated into that uh, Zoom Zoom meeting, uh, it was uh, enjoyed it as well. Uh, and and the good thing is, is that you get so wide variety of views. You know, you're not just getting you, me, or uh, just another guest that we normally have. It's it's everybody who's in that has got a, a chance to, uh, for speaking, haven't they, Paul? That's correct. And and I just saw Don add into chat, and, and and he'll know. He'll say he's, he's, he's forgot, which is which I had done. Uh, all of the all of the awakening information, including the film clip and and everything else, is on the Truth Proof website. So you know, well, as well as well as Les and myself advertising it here. If you want to visit the website. Everything's there, all that information that Les has just given out and myself. So truthproof.uk, yep. it's all available to view there and it'll be there 24 hours a day. And, uh, yeah. And uh, for anybody who's new into uh, this stream on Truthproof, uh, you do have a series of books uh, for sale as well, which they can buy on the on the truthproof.uk uh, website as well. Tell us a little bit about the books, Paul. Yeah, Truthproof books. That's the first, that's the cover of the first book behind us. Uh, and... Truthproof.uk, all the paperbacks. So we've got Truthproof 1, 2, 3 and 4. And the night people that you can see turning around on the screen behind Les and he's just put the pictures up there. They're available on the website. You can also get them on e uh, eBay. And the Kindle versions are also available on Amazon. And Don, I just noticed again, Don says in the Zoom chat, we can get up to 100 in the chat. So I, wow. I don't know who's going to be managing that, Don. I don't know whether you're going to give yourself an headache, but uh, providing... You can cope with it. We're good to go with it. So, yeah, we'll yeah. try and set that up for a few weeks' time. Yeah, so don't forget, folks, if you're interested, uh, I don't know what the procedure is, Don. If Don can give us the procedure, how people can uh, get into contact yeah, good, with you. Yeah, good point, Les. Yeah, uh, have they got to contact Don direct or is he, he'll probably send us a link. I think he did last time. He sent us a link, Les, thinking about it now. And they he sent up. us a link, yeah. And, uh, but, uh, remember, it's going to be come first come, first serve. Kind of thing. Oh, of course, yeah. Okay. Okay, look. Uh, we'll move on with a, another uh, account. Are the books available digitally? Yes, they're on. They're on uh, Amazon, and I see that Sky's just put the link to the website up. Thank you. Sorry, Les. Yeah, let's move on. Yeah, and um, where do we leave off? Did we do the? Have we done the Hornsey creatures? We, yeah, we've done. We've done that. We've one. done. Oh, the Burley Gap UFO. 2015 yeah. is uh, interesting to me. It's fabulous uh, sighting. And, you yeah. know, this guy, I've met him. Where is... Go on. Yeah, what's the location of this? Uh, it's, it's near Beachy Head. Right. And I've okay. got it wrong. Because I live in Bridlington, I actually went on to Howard Hughes' show and touched on this uh, last week, and I, I call it Burlington Gap. <laughs> ah. Well, I would put me right because he knew areas, which is fine because I've got to get it right, haven't I? Bridlington, Burlington, I don't know, some ticked in my head, so it's Burley Gap. Some people will be more of familiar with location than me, I've never been. So, October the 9th, 2015, and this is when it happened. Well, just a brief history of how I got the sighting. I met Jason, Jason Hughes, I'd met him, no relation to Howard, by the way, I'd met him several times at conferences, and, you know, just acquaintances and touched on the subject and at the last awakening he said he'd got a sighting that he wanted to share with me and would I get in touch with him and I, I said well, yeah yeah let's just let's 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 connect in the next few weeks few months after the UF, after the UFO conference and he did just that and he'd got this incredible story to tell me and so much so that he traveled up last week and because he wanted to tell me in person 
you know, that kind of tells you just how genuine some people are that they're going to travel that distance to tell you. I mean, normally it's other way about, and we're, we're you know, less we're doing running about to, to, to witnesses and, and to get the information. But he travelled up to tell me about his sighting. <clears throat> it's not going to take hours, people, but, it, <clears throat> but nevertheless, it's, it's interesting. So he said, 2015, Octo October the 9th, and he decided he was going to go for an evening drive. It was about 8.30 p.m. And he's driving towards Beachy Head. He, and he planned to drive on to Burley Gap. I must get that right and not call it Burlington Gap, people. So he planned to drive on to Burley Gap. So he's driving towards a little village called East Dean. So I've, all I've done, I've done what I tell everybody else to do and just Google these areas and just follow it on maps. So I've been looking at the location, which is what everybody else can do if they're sufficiently interested, because I think it's, a, it's an interesting one. He turned a sharp corner heading towards the village. And I think it was on his right hand side. He said there's some open land when he sees a bright light land, not landed, but in the field, because at this point we're thinking farm machinery. There's a bright light in the field. And it's stationary and it's quite big, uh, eight to ten feet. He, he sort of envisaged it, and he's thinking like a bit of farm machinery. He's not alarmed. We, as uh, everybody knows, that farmers will work through at night to get what they've got a bit done on the land. Although I think it's only sheep grazing and stuff, but nevertheless, farm machinery. He says, as he's driving along, next thing, this object starts to rise. So it's, it's in the air. So now he's interested. There's no sound. It's a brilliantly bright light. And it's, it's only about 100 foot away from him, he estimates. And it's about 40 foot in the air, 40 to 50 feet in the air. And it's totally silent. And it's coming towards him. And there's a light that's just now filled his car. This light's gold. Does that sound familiar, people? The gold lights, you know? This is a golden sphere of light. And he said, I've got my hand over my face and I'm getting nervous now because he said, it's as though it's fixed in the center of the window of my car. He said, so as I'm weaving and turning and driving, this thing's not, it's not moving from where its fixed position is at the side of him. <clears throat> he said, it was like a sun, a second sun. He said, it was just that bright. He said, now look, I put my hand over my face and I've got, I'm trying to drive with one hand. I'm doing a ridiculous speed, trying to get away from it, dangerously fast. And I look at the car and the car's like a crimson to orange color inside. Everything's filled with this orange light. He's terrified. And uh, <clears throat> he feels it getting closer. He, I think he said that he, he went around this corner towards this uh, patch of trees. He did tell me, the exact area i'm sorry people that i haven't got that in my head at this this present time but there's a lay by and he pulled in expecting the light to be there and when he pulled in it had gone so gathers himself for a, for a while just gets his composure he's frightened and i'm not sure if he told me that at this point he called his partner and his daughter and they'd said to him when he got home look it, it didn't even sound like you on the phone you were that scared he said you know if this 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 2015 sighting of, of two to three minutes has changed this man's life, quite literally. And uh, any role, he turned around and wanted to run back to see where, if he could see it, there's no trace of this thing, this object, this sphere of light, whether there's something structured behind it or not, I don't know. But what he's told me now is that since that night, and I'm not gonna say the next day, but he's suffered health problems. He's got arthritis everywhere in his body. Didn't have arthritis before. I don't think the family have got a history of arthritis. He's only in his... I, I ought to have asked him his age, but we've got lots more conversations to come. And I would have said that Jason's about 48, 50, 50 years old. And he's had eye operations for cataracts, for cysts, not just cataracts, cysts as well. He's had, had operations on his feet and everything that has kind of stemmed all these uh, debilitating, life-changing injuries seem to have come about after seeing the UFO or after having the contact with the UFO. So that's basically, in a nutshell, 
the Burley Gap UFO sighting. So a, a two to three minute encounter with an intense sphere of light. Uh, if that isn't incredible enough, this man believes has now affected his health as well. So once again, we'll throw it out there. Anybody that's had encounters with things otherworldly, should we say, and you think that you've got some kind of long-lasting health issues afterwards, I'd love to hear about it. These long-lasting health issues that he's uh, talked about, Paul, um, when he sees these health professionals and they assess him, have the, have the talks of it, is, is any of it attributable to, say, radiation? Well, he's, he, what the what the doctor... He's probably done what I did, you know, when I went with holes in my back in particular and uh, they were asking me all sorts of strange questions. And he's probably saying nothing. He's probably not even told them about the, the UFO or, or the, the sphere of light. I wouldn't have thought he has. What they've told him is the operations that he's having on his eyes are highly unusual and a man of his age should not be getting these cysts on the eyes and the cataracts on both eyes uh, that, that he's getting. So um, there's there's lots more in-depth questions that I need to be asking, Jason, uh, you know, in the future, without a doubt, but to, just to give people a breakdown of it now. And once again, I mean, we, we can't believe everybody and not everybody's on the level, but we've got a man here who's travelled a lot, a long distance, to share this encounter and uh, I, yeah, I full credit, take my hat off to him. You know, I could, I could see the emotion. I could see the sincerity of, of in his voice. I could hear it, should I say. And uh, yeah, I, I'm so quite blown away by his sighting and his encounter. Yeah, so more to come on that I would think then, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to move on to the, uh, the I'll take it back in time to 1985 and the, Deep Car UFO. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, That's a good one. Deep Car. Now, what we're doing here, you, you, earlier you talked about Warncliffe Woods. This is this is next to Warncliffe Woods. This is all. Next door. This is all. And this is, <clears throat> we think 1985. What we've got to understand here, people, or what we've got to go back to is we've got a a, a, a lady now who's, I think she said she was 50 or, or thereabouts, 13 at the time. Uh, we'll do the maths here, can't we? But she, she thinks she was 13. And uh, Deborah, that's her real name. Uh, no need to say a surname. And she's living in a parent's house. Uh, at Wil and she don't mind me saying the road because we're not going to set number or anything like that. She don't live there now. Wilson Road, Deep Car. She's 13 years old. Picture's been 1985. And she's looking out the back windows of the home and they look out onto what's called the Jennifax Brick Factory, which is no longer there. And I, I think to the right, we've got Warncliffe Crags, which will be close to where our witness with the strange creatures in 1987 had his incredible encounter in Warncliffe Woods. And the crags, I think they range from about 60 to 100 foot. If there's any people within the chat that know height of Warncliffe Crags, please, uh, you know, enlighten us. And, she told us about the events, or told me about the events that unfolded. I mean, I've had lots and lots of correspondence with this lady and, I've, and some in-depth telephone conversations, and there's more to come, because I, I want to gather as much as I can. So you're not going to get all the story today, but uh, you, you'll get you'll get a, a large section of it. So 13 years old, early evening, looking out, and she can see the brick factory, which is no longer there. And she sees a ufo low over the brick factory and it's oval shaped and she says that it's got lights underneath it because she can see underneath it there at this angle with the property and the, and there's lights around it and her first thoughts were it looked like something from close encounters it's exactly what she thought she said if ever she watches close encounters or when she has watched it since it always comes to mind that, that that's that's what it was. That's what she was looking at. And I asked her its size. I says, can you estimate its size then, Deborah? You know, she said, well, I want to say, she says, we lived in a council house, semi-detached. She says, I imagine three of those houses, hers and another two together. That's about the length of three houses. Uh, and it's, it's, it's oval shaped. And she's watching this thing, this, this incredible UFO. And... I'm not, I'm not sure if she said that during the sighting, I think she said after the sighting, she rang her grandma. Might have got that bit wrong. 
So but all this can be polished. <laughs> it's a work in progress, people. And uh, she rang her grandma, told her what she'd seen. Grandma said, shut the curtains, lock the doors and hide under the table. It's kind of words of our time if, if kind of thing. That's probably, I could imagine my grandma saying something like that to me back, back in the day, back in 1985. So she, we've told, she's told us all this and a few days later, because she can't think, think of nothing else. She's seen some potentially, we all know it could just be an helicopter. And we've got a young girl that's like blown away because there's an helicopter over in a brick factory, but there are elements to it now that kind of take it away from that. So we don't know the exact time frame after, and I'm sure Deborah's going to correct me if she listens to this or when we speak. So we'll say a few days after, a week after, but definitely not a long time after. She's, she's looking in the direction of the brick factory again, but she can also see Warncliffe crags. And she can see the object again. It's there, it's over the crags. But this time, it's further away, and this time it's coming down. And the crags, are, above the crags apparently, because I've never walked on them, I've not been up that area, it's all like moorland, heather and peaty land. And this thing landed. She's sure it did. It said everything around it looked like an orange glow and it landed. She said she could even think that there were flames. It was like a fire. So the next day, she told a friend, Karen, and they decided to go and investigate. So that, you know, they, that they wanted to see what, what, what had landed. She told us she'd seen the spaceship again. They had to take Karen's little sister, who was only nine. And that kind of figures in in a, in a moment. But, but uh, they, get, they don't have to climb the crags. There's other ways of getting up onto the crags without climbing this sheer rock face because we've got the touch on the rock face shortly into this story. So then when they get up there, and sure enough, after a little bit of searching, they come across something like a 30-foot circle of scorched and burnt heather. And they stood in it. I find it fascinating that they could have been stood where something from another world had stood. And nobody, the powers that be or anybody, even, were even aware. How incredible. Do you, do you, do you know what I mean? I, 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 that kind of, I'm sorry for saying it and sound a bit blown away myself, but, if, you know, potentially she was stood on, on the ground where something from somewhere else had landed. So they stood there, they're watching it. Uh, like I said, with little girl was only nine years old. And sort of discussing it and thinking what it could be they're only young girls only 13 year old and a nine year old i don't think they realized significance of what they'd seen or what they were where they were stood but then as they looked into distance on more they can see people and suddenly become aware and there's there's three to four adults she, she knows there were three she said there could have been four and there's 12 children and they're in distance and children had got she said, like milkmaids' outfits on and little pink hats. And the adults were dressed in like Victorian dress and bibola hats. My friends backed her up on this. A friend's willing to talk. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We, we, he, all these years later, she's still around. Uh, I don't mean that she shouldn't be still around, but well, she's they're still there to talk to the, you know, her other witnesses. And they're, they're trying to work out what they could be doing because there's nothing for miles around. There's no buildings or anything. Is it some kind of reenactment? I'm not sure that's what came into their mind at the time. But uh, so then they realised that they'd got closer. And I couldn't understand that because they were a long way away and then they were closer. So they decided to run. They felt a little bit frightened that they decided to run. And the, they can't run really fast because they've got the nine-year-old with them and they look round and they're even closer. And they've, they've, they've covered an enormous amount of ground. But suddenly, and I think this is the reason for it, they're not interested in this circle of earth anymore, this circle of burnt earth. They, they just want to get away. Their tension's just gone from it. And uh, they looked round, they looked round a, a second time, second time, a third time, they're closer. And then when they looked round again and they'd left this, this area, this vicinity, They'd gone. The strange people on the moor had gone. And I can't help but thinking that the phenomena, whatever it was, 
that was the phenomena in some other guys. Why Victorian outfits? And uh, I don't know whether there's some glitch or whether they've witnessed a time slip because what we've said before uh, about lots and lots of unexplained phenomena in areas where unrelated phenomena seems to present. Is that what was happening? Were the UFOs there in 1987, in October 1987, just, just something that happened because of some thin area within the fabric of our world and other things were allowed to come through as well? These strange people might have had nothing to do with the UFO. My gut feeling is it, 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 they had, but I can't ever say that. So next thing, they've vanished. Right, a moment of time, a, a period of time passed. Have you any questions on that, Les, before we go on? No, no, no. 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 I'm, just, I'm just fascinated with the story. It, it, it is interesting. I found it fascinating because it goes on and on. So from this UFO that looked like something from Close Encounters, and I could imagine, I don't know, a quarter of a mile away, some helicopter all lit up over him for five minutes to a, to a 13-year-old perceiving it as, a have just seen a UFO. And then turning a search like I don't know, but it, there's too many there's too many parts to it that tell me this is something genuine and otherworldly. She said she's still fixed on this window, still fixed on looking out onto the moor, looking out onto the crags because of these experiences: the UFO, the second UFO, the strange Victorian dressed people. So a period of time passes again. I'm not going to say a day, two days, but not long. Yeah, you know, I mean, and I don't think even Deborah knows the amount of time that passed. But well, she's looking out onto the crags. Here's where I'd like somebody to give me eye to these crags. I'm, I'm tipping 60 to 100 feet. She said, and she used, she was used to seeing men going up and down the crags, climbing them. She says, I could see them in the red cagoules, you know, the raincoats and the blue ones. And I'd watch them climb the crags, and which is a pursuit that most... <laughs> A lot of people do, isn't it? You know, you're not just it's not just res resigned to one cliff crags. I said, but it's daytime, and at the base of the cliff, I can see th three strange men. But they're big. I realise that the 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 they're at least twice as big as normal men. She said, and they're really long. They've got long, thin white arms. They're white. They're completely white. Long, thin legs. The bodies are long, and there's three of them. She said, and they started to climb the cliffs. Now, she said, I watch the people climb the cliffs regularly in the cagoules, like we just said, and it takes, like, we'll say an hour, 45 minutes, an hour to reach the top. She said, have you ever seen how a caterpillar moves? You know, when they sort of bunch, like, you know, and then move again. She said, in, in about five moves, these things went up the cliff and over the top. So, and she couldn't believe what she was seeing. So that's basically that's four events within days or weeks of one another witnessed by this lady. And uh, I, I spoke to Philip Mantle about it, uh, Philip the Oracle, because, I mean, we know that Philip's got lots of knowledge about that area. I've also been speaking to a, a, a guy whose who's name, because of his job, he was a police officer, uh, he he, he don't want me to use his name and he's given me some information relating to the period. Now, we've got to be certain that it's 1985 because he's telling me about the strange occurrences that were happening at Stocksbridge Bypass, which is very close with security guards who claim to have seen children in Victorian dress dancing around power line, uh, telegraph poles, you know, pylons and being very frightened. Now, I'm not going to bend a story to make it fit or become even more exciting. This guy tells me that was 1987. At the moment, we're going with 1985 for Deborah's story. I'd love them to be both 1985 or both 1987 because I'll, I love finding all yeah. the connecting bits, but it's still fascinating. We've got one location fairly close to each other that's yeah. producing masses of unexplained phenomena. Yeah, and, and over a, a period of time. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, I mean, them cliffs they range from eight to 900 feet in height. No, I don't depending think... Depending on where you are. I don't think they do, Les. I don't think they do. And, oh, sorry, I'm just on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> really? They might do. Yeah, yeah. It I, says uh, the Upper Don Valley around uh, 820 feet above sea level and the highest spot is two hundred at 974 feet. Ah, but that's not the cliffs. That'll be above sea level. 
uh, I'm, I'm talking about the the worn cliff cliffs themselves, crags. They might not. Yeah, that that's what this is about. Okay, yeah. Okay. Right. Well. Yeah. We, we, we shall we shall see, but yeah. So we'll chuck a Wikipedia few more to the that rescue. Yeah. Wikipedia to the rescue. There. Yeah. Uh, no, that's 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 an amazing story, that Paul. And as you will say, if the if the timing's ta ta uh, the year time uh, coincides with uh, the other accounts, uh, as you mentioned, then it's even more. Uh, it is because the security guards, from from what my contacts who's emailed me and, and we spoke on the phone, all this has been this week. Uh, you know, and there's there's more accounts. I'm sorry, people, for not getting through them all, but I assure you, there's a pile of folders on my my PC here that, and I will be contacting everybody and you know I will because that's what I do that's why I'm up at stupid o'clock 5am in the morning trying to get through this stuff but um, yeah there'll be more to come and De Deborah's sighting Deborah's experience is just incredible uh, they all are Jason's you know it's just it's just it's a fascinating uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating time to be alive i think when we're getting all this all these people becoming more and more open sharing this information okay do you want to where uh, it's on a few questions from the chat yeah, it saves me thinking too much <clears throat> brilliant uh I'm trying to pick up from where i left off okay so we've got um alex uh thompson uh, welcome uh, to tonight's stream alex if you're still with us uh, Paul, do you think all alien visitors are interdimensional uh, rather than space? And then it drops tails away there. Uh, rather than space creatures, I reckon. He's, uh... Well, do you know, what, Alex? I mean, I suppose all I can do is I'm I'm same as rest of us. All I could do, be doing is speculating. I I, I don't know. Uh, uh, the, the possible? I don't think that everything's coming from the vastness of outer space i mean people talk about the impossibilities you know men of science talk about the impossibilities of it happening because of the distances involved and and you know they, they could be right but how do we know that are there laws of physics are the law are, are they just universal throughout the universe i don't know or has some kind of advanced intelligence a million years in front of us found ways around it because some of the things that we were talking about only 50 years ago that were impossible are now possible and are have been shown in to, to come to fruition so i don't know is the answer are they interdimensional i don't know enough about interdimensional travel and and and, and what it involves to be able to comment to, in in any qualified way but they're definitely here so they're not traveling well, from, yeah, yeah they're, they're here i've always well, said that why are we looking in outter space it, it it troubles me that with this, there all these telescopes and all these trillions of pounds sent to different planets and or, you know or, or the, the moon all this money spent and and they're going to colonize it how i mean we've got all resources here on this planet that we're actu actually just stripping it off and and ruining we, they, they want they want us to go to somewhere with nothing and colonize it yeah it's fascinating uh, well yeah and that. uh yeah no that's uh no, that's quite valid uh points there i'll just put my little spin on that one paul mm, go on. um in so much as uh, we've been told repeatedly that the military are uh, are around uh, 50 years uh, uh, more advanced in technology than what we are living now. All right. Mm -hmm. So if you if you go along with that premise, and then you go along with what everybody's heard of the Roswell crash and and other crashes where they've supposedly taken entities, then. I would go not for the interdimensional, but more with what governments know about now. And these creatures are actually here, probably, most probably, underground bunkers and under the sea. Yeah, yeah. There's a good possibility that these things are already here and living in these inaccessible places around the world. But, you know, there's lots of things, like you just said, 50 years in advance, you know, the guy that the, the I can only touch on this because I've not really prepared myself to talk about it. I don't mean it's hard, but I, I need more knowledge. I need to know what I'm talking about better. But the guy who who told me about uh, the, the police officer who told me about um, Warncliffe and Deep Car and the Stocksbridge bypass had a sighting of his own, which I, I'd like to talk at in depth in a future live stream. But basically, he saw a triangle 
and Judy's job in the force, he never actually told anybody. He says, because back in the day, I can't even remember the year he told me. So that's why I don't want to get too deep into it. He said, but I, I probably never, I would have never progressed through the ranks and I would have probably just been the subject of people's ridicule. He said, but I believe they're ours. I believe they're our own. These things are not from outer space. And I, hmm. I, I asked him his rationale, like, why did he think that? He said, because there was an opening in this object, this huge triangle, and I could see up inside it. That's how close it was. He said, and those walkways and gantries, he says, and I don't imagine aliens. And I mean, I know we, we, we're trying to perceive how they be. He says, but I can't imagine them having steps and stairs and walkways and gantries. He says, and there were people inside it and they were waving to me. <laughs> and you know, so he, he makes a good point. Uh, you know, but we've, then we've got the triangle sightings. John Hansen. Like, let's, every, if you don't know John Hansen, he's the guy responsible for the Haunted Skies books. John's, how old is John? He's in his 70s. He's as much, ex-detective, police, police detective. As much knowledge on the UFO subject than, as anybody I know. And he's got the biggest archive of UFO reports if not in UK, in the world. He's, he's got the, the UFO museum that he's just started uh, kind of publicising. And we need John back on the live stream because his knowledge is impeccable. But where am I going with this? John's got reports of triangles from 1901. <laughs> Do you know? So if these are government projects that, and in 1901, I'm not even sure that we had motor vehicles, did we? You know, my dad years ago used to work on a on vintage cars for a program, and I'm showing my age now, called Flambards. Uh, and uh, not upstairs, downstairs, it were called Flambards. And he used to restore these cars, and they had cars on there called D. Didions, and I think they were 1905, 1903 cars that he were working on. So basically, where am I going with it? What I'm saying is if, if these cars had wooden wheels and, and solid rubber round rim, and John Hansen's got reports of flying triangles in 1901. So if it's mm -hmm. government technology, then there's, there's, there's something wrong with this world if we've not been using it. And I've, I've often said, like, if, if the 1990s triangles were so silent, so advanced, so fast, why aren't we using them now? And I don't just mean for conflict. Why aren't we using them to, to, for transportation? Uh, you know, I, 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 it, it puzzles me. Yeah, same with yeah. I, I mean, I mean, just sorry to interrupt no, you there, but, but it, it it could be you're kind of asking the questions. Why do why haven't we got access to this uh, uh, um, free uh, energy? Well, if it is free energy, thing. I mean, uh, well, everything has yeah, a cost. I mean, but yeah, yeah. But there's there's all sorts. But, but technology there, as you'll say, well, take the premise that if we see uh what we perceive as a flying saucer in the sky and we don't know what it's held up by no wings not not moving forward backwards and it's just up there then uh, that technology uh, is using energy and that energy is what you know mm. yeah well, you, you have to make a good point les i mean but there's so many there's so many pluses and minuses you know we, we hear people talking about the military abductions. This wasn't an alien abduction. This is a military abduction where these, where somehow some military technology can come into your home and abduct you. Uh, I find that I, I, I find it too far fetched. I, I, a lot more far fetched than the 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 alien hypothesis that people are being abducted, for want of a better word, by aliens from by beings from somewhere else, the outer nowhere. Well, not say space. I find that a lot more plausible than the military doing it. Why do I think that? Because if the military had got that te technology, that capability, then a lot of these people that we've been trying to eradicate in the world would have been eradicated by now. They wouldn't have just gone into little Timmy's bedroom and abducted him one night. Uh, uh, and do you, do you know what I'm saying? Maybe I'm oversimplifying things, but uh, for the people that say that we're having these military abductions, I don't think it's happening, seriously. Well, um, just, to, just to spin that web a little bit further even, who's to say that there's uh, no, uh, that the exi um, restrictions don't exist on using what you can use it for, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. In other words, you couldn't use it to stop conventional wars or what have you. 
yeah. but you can use it for this thing, but you can't use it for that. Well, I suppose so. I, I, I don't know, Les. I suppose... Rabbit hole, Paul, it's, that it's, one. It's a rabbit hole. I've probably just opened up one for myself there, but uh, there you go. Uh, Shall we get a couple more in? Yeah, yeah. What we got... Questions. Yeah, questions. Are uh, good. Yeah. Like it, yeah. Um, okay, Gemma Jackson. Uh, welcome to the show, Gemma. And uh, Paul, what is your best case that you've investigated? Good God, the, 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 they're all they're all good, you know. And, and I don't mean because Paul's investigating them. I and there's some people talked about some cases, uh, Gemma. And I think to myself, God, I wish I'd have been involved in that. But uh, I think Humanby, the the, the Humanby events and ultimately finishing with a, a, a landed ufo is i think it ranks with the best ufo events in the world and it's so sad the only person that's wrote about it is me and and it, it, even sadder are the th yeah the three witnesses the primary witnesses are still alive and i can speak to one of them tomorrow if i want to i can speak well i can speak to two of them the third one's very reluctant to speak but where do I go with Humanby? I think uh, just briefly jumping away from your question, Gemma. We'll me and everybody knows I'm going to. Oh, not everybody, but I'm going to be doing some work with Chris Turner. We're going to do some documentaries and we're going to do some work together. But that doesn't mean me and Les aren't going to do some work together. And we're thinking of a long-term project. And I think Humanby would be a brilliant project. Yeah, we're not uh, ruling Hun Hunmanby out of anything here. I, would I think it's it really rattled some to... cages, Les Hunmanby, to be honest with you, because uh, it, it were a yeah. real UFO-related event. But not only that, everything that happened surrounding Hunmanby, and we, we haven't got even the time to touch on it tonight, people, But and you, most of you will know a bit about it, 96, 97, 98, poltergeist activity. Even, even a cryptid, Sasquatch-type sighting, uh, coins falling from air, pebbles falling from air, light bulbs exploding, uh, disjointed voices, also every type of phenomena then culminating in 1998 with a UFO landing, sighting of aliens, military involvement. Umumbi's got all the components. It's absolutely incredible. And then if I were, then you can jump to Willsthorpe. I mean, Willstock, Christ, I mean, it's, it's three miles away from where I'm sat now and there's 16 flats on the edge of the North Sea. To the right, there's nothing. To the left, there's a, like half a mile down, there's a little holiday complex. You've got the North Sea in front of you. You've got farmland behind you and that's it, 16 flats. The, most, for the most part, in the, in the winter months, are just empty because the holiday lets. There's a few people living in them permanently. You go to the bottom of the garden at Willstock, you can throw a stone into the sea at high tide. And we've got a UFO related event on September the 15th, 2009. It, it, that's another incredible one. So I'm, I'm, I am being biased, Gemma, but some of the things that I've looked into are as good as any cases anywhere in the world. And I wouldn't mind a little bit of help with them, I'll be honest with you, because at the, the moment I've got this too much for me to take on, I'll be honest, there really is. The uh, disabled man is asking, um, is Wolf, is Wolf Lands, I think he's talking about, uh, he's got Wolf Mans here, <laughs> is Wolf Lands going to be on TV? We, we can't say we, at that we, moment we don't, in time. No, we, we would like it to, I mean, uh, ultimately, ultimately yeah, that would we, be great. we would love it to, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think the content of Wolf Lands, and don't this sound like a boss, but if you can't brag about something that you're proud of, I think the content and the witness reports are as good as anything you're going to hear. Uh, we've done the best we can with Wolflands, basically, and hands up on a low budget, to the point where Mary, my wife's mate, costume, it's took her years. It's not the best costume in the world, but I tell you what, you look at these programmes on the TV where the, you see these creature sightings, it's as good as most of them. You know, uh, it really is. You're not going to think this is... Uh, somebody in a pantomime outfit running across stage you'll you'll be, you'll be thinking christ what the hell's that so yeah uh jumping from that is it going to be on tv how long is a piece of string we'd love it to be but let's just see time will tell and uh, just a timely thing there now you mentioned that uh, we've got to appreciate all the uh, monetary support that we've had on the super chats over the last oh, uh, year or yeah. so <clears throat> and uh and we haven't forgotten about those, so that's great. And uh... it's, it's the support as well. I mean, you, you know, there's a lot of people, Les, that 
obviously you will, you will get negative comments because we've, we, I mean, we thought it were going to be ready at least a year ago and it's still not ready. And we've been saying we're nearly there. We're nearly there. But that's the thing. There's two people making this film. Now, it's, it's, we've, we've done, it's in the hands of the people producing the music now. And that's my daughter, Jessica, and, and her husband, Nick, because they have a recording studio, and Mick Park and Nick Britton. And, and they're working on the music. The music, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's spectacular. It's just, we're so fortunate. This isn't just some piece of music that's been bought and we thought, we'll just chuck, throw this over top at film. Every component at film's got this, these, these rushes and ah, just fabulous blown away by it anyway we're not doing questions are we <clears throat> yeah so yeah um Gemma jackson got another question in oh goody uh paul who's been your most credible witness i know this one is going to be an hard one because there's lots and lots of people you've talked with over the years and you know equally as good as each other aren't they? yeah I've, i think i got that i'm just looking at joe's saying i'm a bridlington lad i'm willing to help you paul i've Contact me, Joel. Uh, but who, who's been the most credible witness? Is that what the question was, Liz? Uh, I don't know, because, you know, there's a lot of people that are, you, you can't... I couldn't name one particular person. that Because everybody's got a different attribute, and you think to yourself, do you know you're on the level, you? I mean, look at Jason travelling from Beachy Head, from all that way. Yeah to come and tell me this story. Would you really do that? There's a thousand people he could have spoke to. And he, he, he travelled up. To, and So that, that, to me, rings of credibility. Then we've got the gamekeeper uh, coming forward and telling this story of what he encountered. And then we've got the guys from Rotherham who were in Broxa Forest and what they encountered. I could, I, you know, every one of them, you could go... Some of them I find credible witnesses for the sheer... Our arduous work it is to get the information out of them and, and the promises that you're not going to reveal their identities and things. And, and sometimes that we know it weakens the story because, you know, I like to give people at least something where not where they can be traced, but it, it, it adds more meat to the bone of what I'm talking about. And they think, yeah, he's right. He's, he's actually said this place, he's added that component and we can you're taking us to that location and these people obviously were there because they couldn't have known about that aspect of the job kind of thing so, yeah. But, but yeah there's there's i couldn't say one particular person there's loads of great witnesses that's what i thought you'd end up saying paul yeah uh, i could that have just said sentence. that in 30 <laughs> seconds but instead i took 30 minutes I yeah right okay um let's have a look then um wow great questions uh, and thanks everybody for sending the questions in uh, I'm just looking. so um, Branch Schnapper Les, what is your most convincing odd experience? Well, I can't say I really had one. It's Paul who you should be directing that uh, question at. Really, I've not really had any experiences as such. Um, and um, yeah, well, so Paul is the, is the man to well, ask on that one. <clears throat> It's kind of followed me from childhood, and I'm, I'll, I'm going to keep it brief because, like you said, we've got foot. We're on 2044. Uh, my own experiences. We had a doubt. My own experiences, and that's what makes me realise that I've got to consider everything, unless you already know everything. <laughs> keep saying it, but no, you've got to consider everything because no matter how quirky, no matter how strange, somebody's story might appear, and no matter what. Odd little elements they might say happened that, that get thrown up. You know, the, the, it's, it doesn't mean that, the, that there's no reality and no truth to what somebody's talking about. So, yeah, I think we've got to you know, just, just consider everything. And ob uh, Yeah, and obviously Paul, um, Paul, yeah, Paul, Paul Flanagan, uh, who asked the question. Um, Oh, sorry. What was I lost? Where I've lost where I've gone over there. Don't yes, worry about it's it. Me that's, it's me that's gone. Uh, dear, what was the. Well, ask another question and I'll just say, sorry, Paul. Yeah, I've, I've lost my way there, people. And, and you probably know that, that happens occasionally uh, from this end. Uh, okay, we'll just go on to. Um... Right, Paul Flanagan. Oh. We'll, we'll go back to Paul Flanagan. Uh, have you got any thoughts on Maggie Thatcher's quotes on 
you can't when she tell the famously people. quoted, "You can't tell the people." <laughs> Not really. Uh, it, obviously, she. I think she said that to a lady called Georgina Brunei. I think she were when she wrote the book, um, the Rendlesham Forest book. I can't remember the name of it now. And I've got the book. I think uh, I sent it to Alison uh, a few months ago, and she kindly sent it me back. I don't know. It was a strange one. I mean, here we've got the Prime Minister of Great Britain, probably. I don't mean one of the greatest Prime Ministers we've ever had, people. I don't don't read too much into this, but probably one of the most influential Prime Ministers that, that, that we will ever see in my lifetime anyway. And I'm no great fan of Margaret Thatcher, by the way. But to ask such a question and to give such a, a strange answer regarding the subject of UFOs when it comes to UFOs, the subject of UFOs, and please correct me if I've t termed it wrong because I haven't got the lines in front of me. You can't tell the people. It, 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 it smacks that already that the, 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 there's things that we're not being allowed to hear. Surely that's what it's telling us. And I don't think that Margaret Thatcher, what kind of person that would think, oh, I just, I'll throw a little bit of intrigue in here for them and this will mix the heads up a little bit. I think it would have, I don't think it would have thrown away comment. I think uh, there was something meant by the comment. Well, that's it, isn't it? Because uh, they, they leak these little things through, Paul, sometimes, and uh, knowingly or unknowingly. And uh, it's these things that we pick up on, isn't it? You yeah. know. So I've got a question from uh, Anthony Hudson. <clears throat> Paul and Les, have you heard of the of the Sam, the Sandown Clown case? I saw that earlier, and I haven't, uh, Anthony. I do apologise uh, for, for, for not hearing it. And, let... and likewise from me. I I'm don't just know writing it that. down because I'll have a look. Wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll about I'll about do this, and it'll be a trick question from Anthony. And it'll be <laughs> only joking, but yeah, we'll have a look at that. Thank you. Uh, Chris M, does Paul believe Defra are aware of what's going on with the animal? Yeah, I do. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah I, I I believe I believe that uh, they might not subscribe to the theory of something from another world doing it, but they know that the in in some instances, whatever's ending these poor unfortunate animals lives is nothing that they can put a finger on let's put it that way i spoke to a farmer when i was looking into willsthorpe funnily enough willsthorpe incident and i went to a farm very close to willsthorpe i'll not set name at farm and i spoke to the guy uh really interested he told me he'd seen a triangle in september over his farm it, it, it was a triangle of lights that were flashing in a triangle above some pylons uh, but that's beside the point. We're talking about animals. He said to me, he said, there was something else as well. Uh, he kept sheep. He said, and he's keen to say, typical sort of Bridlington, Flamborough, Bempton kind of terminology, real real sort of blunt and straight to the point. And he says, sheep can't jump. And, and, and I'm saying, what do you mean? He says, well, I went out to the field once. He says, they're all in this field. There's a fence three foot fence separating another field that's empty that's full of sludge he said there's barbed wire running along top of it so that'll come into play in a moment he says now go out to this during this 2009 incident he says oh, look, there's a sheep in other field fully grown you he says and it's it's laid down don't look good it's not dead he says and i sort of straight out to it i'm out he says i open gate I look on, first thing I do is I look along the fence for wool. As, as, as someone dragged it over the fence, there's no wool. He says, and they don't jump. He says, says they just don't. Not, not a three foot fence with, with wire on it and the full, he says, it's in a right state. I'm not going to go into too much graphically, but it's in a right state. His it, it, eyes have been removed and it's alive. So he gets vetting and it's humanely killed and police come. So the police come and investigate. There's one pair of Wellington boats going to the sheep. It's all soft sludge. There's no footprints of the sheep where it is from the fence, and it's about 30 foot away. He says, they're out of that field, he says, because it was just like slurry. He said, and there's, there's no footprints. So so police officer come, and he goes, well, clearly, he says, a, a, a dog or somebody's someone's done it, some animal. He says, so first thing I said to police officer well there's just my footprints there there's no footprints in mud or anywhere around it how's it done it he went oh yeah you're right defra come 
we've just been on about. That's why we, I knew we'd relate. I always get back to it eventually, people. And uh, obviously the, the sheep's removed. He tried to look into it and they just closed him down. They were quite abrupt with him. He wanted to know what had, what the conclusions were, what had killed this sheep. He never found out. Uh, I'm not going to say he believed it were alien related, but he, he knew there was something highly unusual. And I'm sure with cases like that and the descriptions and the police reports that are filed, it must leave them scratching their heads. It's almost like <clears throat> senior Coast Guard that I, I speak to quite regularly. I won't say regularly, quite regularly. He, he tells me that he knows that they've seen unknowns. He knows that true unknowns have been seen, been reported, but you know, he says you'll never find a log that says anything suggesting anything like that. He says, because we're taught what not to put down, what not to write. And it's probably the same with organisations such as this. And they're very powerful as well, aren't they? You know, so you, you, you don't you don't really get nowhere with with people and, and powerful organisations like that. And yeah, that's my views on it. Quick fire question here from Steve 71. Paul, is there anyone that you would like uh, who would be the person you would like most to talk to on Truth Proof as regards this topic? Um, no, we've had some great guests on. We're hoping, hoping to get Ken Gerhard on in a few weeks' time. I'm not saying he's going to be a world-beating guest, but I know he's, he's going to be highly entertaining. And it's a good question It's because it's not one I've really thought about. And I don't, what, what about you, Les? I mean... Uh, well... I look at it like this, Paul. I mean, um, you could say some some guests are are in the personality class, mm. and they're extremely interesting. But there's equally people who are like you yourself, and a lot and some people in the chat who are are, are as equally interesting. And uh, I'm not sure so if that's it's, an insult. <laughs> I'm joking, go on. Paul. Yeah, well um, done, Les. It's good. Yeah, it was good that one, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. So basically, uh, what I'm saying is, I think if you've got a story to tell, it doesn't matter who tells it, whether they've been on TV or or they've been nowhere. Mm. So basically, you're saying I'm nowhere, but yeah, all good. No, somebody's put Linda Moulton Howe. Uh, yeah, she'd be she'd be interesting to talk to, I suppose. Uh, I'm I'm not. Sold on idea of trying to get Linda Moulton Howe on here. Let's put it that way. I've spoken to Linda. I spoke to her at a waiting conference a few years ago. Spent an hour in a company. She wanted to know all about the the strange occurrences at Bempton, particularly when the animals were being killed. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Now, I, I, I wouldn't want Linda Moulton Howe on the live stream, and I've no axe to grind with Linda Moulton Howe. But that's as much as I'd say. There we go. So that answers that one. Now I've probably missed some. Uh... Skips a few here. Um, Jack Todd, I might get this one in. Paul, could you sap say what you know about the big grey man at Ben Mac MacDowie, uh, uh, Scotland Mountain, uh, alleged being? Uh, right, if, the, if we'd have had a question that said, is there anywhere you would like to go, this would have been the place. Uh, I don't know a great deal, but I do know I'd like to visit the area and not just for a day or a night i'd like to spend at least three or four days there and is it is it some kind of illusion that people are experiencing you know that, like with with strange effects of the light and echoes on the mountain it's not even a mountain it's more like a big mound to be honest but it's something that's been reported it's going back hundreds of years and uh, dr peter McHugh, we had on the live stream uh, as, as more m knowledge on the big grey man, but it's it's a place I'd love to go and experience, and and see whether there's anything to experience there. But I'd I'd be like the people who come to Bempton and speak to them because a lot of them that come and please don't let me put you off coming. You're expecting the experience, and unexplained phenomena is not going to present to order. So the chances are we could make the trip to Scotland and get to the big the area of, of, of Ben Mac Dewey and probably stay there a year and nothing had happened because everything seems random or, or, or perfectly placed. Yeah, no, that seems a great place to uh, actually uh, visit and uh, and if you've got the legs to get up there and uh, see what well, it's all I've about. I think I've still got the legs, Les. Okay. Yeah, I've got them. That's all right. Right. Uh, another pop of me, are you? 
Yeah, well, Lee Roscoe is asking, did uh, did you, Paul, go back to Bempson Cliffs and search the hill since the light was seen? So if anybody who doesn't know about uh, the light, probably uh, we can enlighten Yeah, get on the web, truthproof.uk website. You'll see some frame grabs of uh, 7th of December. Myself, Bob Brown and Peter, we're up on the cliff tops. See a gold light on the cliff top. On the, on the hill at the back of the cliffs, should I say. I'd seen it, Bob and Pete hadn't, and I, I brought it to their attention. We stood looking and a, like a gold red ball just lifted. Stayed in the air, fraction of a second, and went back down, lit it all up gold, and I put the camera on, and we managed to get it on film. One, And you can see the frame crap, uh, grabs that I've got. Uh, I've been around the area. Of course, that area is out of bounds, and I, I, I can't go on the land. So... I haven't been up to visit the approximate area, not without landowner's permission, and I've not sought it, so I'm not going to go on it. Same with anywhere up there. I'll only go within, of course I would, landowner's uh, permissions. There you go. Chris M. Yeah, Chris M. is asking, has Paul got any particular experiments he'd like to try up at Benson? I know you've tried uh, two or three already. Yeah, we... <clears throat> who asked that question? Chris Evans? Oh. No, uh, Chris M. Chris M. Right, Chris. Yeah. There's... There's lots of things we'd like to try, and and, and there's lots of things. If anybody uh, scientifically minded or qualified wants to come up and and throw the rat in ring and and ex do some of these experiments that we can document, I'd love it. Uh, I've noted that people have ex experienced temperature changes, and um, in just just within ten feet of somewhere that's cold, and then you come into a warmer area. We've experienced it ourselves, so we've bought thermometers and placed them in the areas we bought emf meters and geiger counters and we, we, we've tried all sorts but I, I can't be everything and that's why it would be great to have other people involved there's a friend of mine peter masters who who's good with electronics and and radio frequencies and he's come onto the cliff tops with us with his laptop with the the equipment that he's actually made and i don't mean he's knocked together in a garden shed this is proper state-of-the-art gear that he's made and uh, he's, he's been testing for strange signals and unusual frequencies up there with me you see i'm i can go up there and do these things but it, you know i'm not qualified to talk about them that's when we'd need peter on or somebody who's who's been with me to the area because you know i feel like a phony if i start trying to talk about things that I, I, i've not really got a great deal of knowledge on I might just get this one in, Paul, and thanks for that, by the way. Uh, Kaylee Overrad Overvides You'll get it uh, right, is asking, it, um, I have had two sightings of black cats in Norfolk. Has Paul or Liz had any sighting of a black cat? It'll have to be a quick fire one, this one, Paul. Well, quick fire. And in answer to your question, yes, there's, there's black cats. Myself and Bob Brown, 2017, it crossed the road driving back from Bempton. They're regularly seen, and uh, and when I say regularly, I don't mean every week, but every year there's reports of black cats around Bempton and Speeton, around North Yorkshire, around Scarborough, Flixton. They're there. These these cats are here, not just black, you know, beige pumas as well. So, yes, is the is the quick fire answer. And thank you yeah, everyone, and, you know, for yeah, all questions. And from, yeah, and from yeah, and the answer from me is no, I have not personally seen any black cats uh, myself. Uh, yeah, so on that note, Paul, I think we are out of time and we are done. Yeah, I'd just like to end one last thing. Right, we have to consider everything unless you already know everything and you don't. So, thank you. On that note, it's good night from me and it's good night from... Me. There we go. Bye-bye. Right, right, thanks every, everybody for joining us tonight. Everybody from uh, from wherever. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. We'll see you next time on the live stream. Truth proof. Good night.